Good evening. Um, before I get into the Galatians study, it was requested that I explain why we're having, um, you know, in, in Passover, we call it Passover, uh, but really Passover is just a few hours on the 14th of Nisan, and then as soon as the sun goes down, it begins unleavened bread, and then the day after the high Sabbath is first fruits, which is the time of resurrection. In the time of Messiah, um, because we have two different calendars, we have the Hebrew biblical calendar, and then we have the uh, the Roman calendar, the Gregorian calendar. Um, we have to remember that all the events of the Bible happen according to the Hebrew calendar, the biblical calendar, not to the Gregorian calendar. So when we see an event that happens on a Sunday, it doesn't mean that Sunday was important. It meant that whatever day it was on the Hebrew calendar, in the case of, of Yom HaBikurim or First Fruits, it was the Hebrew day that was important. It just happened to fall on a Sunday in that particular year. Actually, it fell on Saturday right after uh, sundown because the scripture says at the beginning of the day or early in the day and, and the biblical calendar and biblical time early in the day is the beginning of the day not the end of the day when you think about in terms of the reality of what went on in context uh, Yeshua gets buried and then the women are preparing spices and they have to go shop for spices and they have to bring them back and they're going to to tend his body N nobody would think that if they could do it after the Shabbat right away that they would wait until the next you know wait wait a long time to do you, you get to the important things in life right away so the Shabbat was over they did that but the point is he was more than likely he uh, he was crucified on uh, Wednesday evening which is actually third don't come into Thursday and he was resurrected right after Shabbat on Saturday at the beginning of Sunday on the calendar if you looked at the calendar days that way. So, put to this year, the 14th day of Nisan is Friday. So that's the day of the Passover sacrifice. And then right after that evening, we begin the 15th day of Nisan. And then at the next day is the 16th day of Nisan. And then at the end of the 16th day of Nisan, is when the resurrection takes place and then we get to the next day after sundown so we're having our seder on monday evening because that's the transition between the 16th and the 17th which is when the resurrection would have happened so we're doing a service on monday evening it's going to be about an hour but it's a time to worship to thank god to rejoice in the resurrection of the messiah uh, and that's really important because that's part foundation of what we believe uh, and what Judaism teaches. Matter of fact, on every, uh, a lot of Shabbats, we, we do uh, Gibor Adonai, uh, the, the uh, part of the Amidah, and it's we thank God for being the, the God of the uh, resurrection. And so resurrection has been always part of Judaism. It's part of Messianic Judaism because Yeshua was the first fruits of the resurrection. If he had just died on the cross, he'd have been like hundreds of thousands of other people that died on the cross. Uh, if he'd just been buried, he'd have been like hundreds of thousands or millions of other people that were buried at that time. But he resurrected, and that's what brings the power to the Gospels, the power of the resurrection. So we will have our, uh, many people will have Seder on Friday evening, and then they'll, uh, on uh, Monday evening, Sunday morning, we're having Kroset making. So we need all the hands to do that. And then on Monday evening, we will have our, First fruits, yes, ma'am. Can I ask a question? Certainly. So, but um, doesn't first fruits? It's not always on one day. Right. It's the day after the high Sabbath. It's it, you have the high Sabbath and the next day. So you have the 14th is Pesach, the 15th is the high Sabbath, the 16th is the day after that, which this year falls on Sunday. Yeah. The end of that is when we celebrate the resurrection, which is three days because it's three days three nights because it's friday day friday night saturday day saturday night and then going into sunday sunday day in the on our calendar sunday day sunday night three days three nights i understand that because the year that you should have died it was three it was days, offset three days, right right between the day he died and the, after the high Sabbath. right but this year it's not this yes, year's it is. first fruits is on sunday that's why you said 
Right, but the high Sabbath is different from the daily Sabbath. I know that. So that's it, just because we have, we have, what we have is we have Friday is the regular Sabbath, and right on top of the Friday to Saturday <coughs> Sabbath is the high Sabbath this year. Right. But we still have Friday, Friday to Saturday, Saturday to Sunday, Sunday to Monday. The end of Sunday, which is the 16th, going to Monday is the third day, and it's the third day of yeah. resurrection. So my other thing is, why were we telling people that the calendars lined up this year when they don't? I didn't. We said they did Shavuot last year. lined up last year. Right, and we said it's going to happen again next year. We said everything's going to be the same on both calendars. And that was my understanding, and that's what I thought we told everybody else. So okay. It's like The Shavuot together. Well, and <coughs> Resurrection Easter. Right. So I thought that they fell on the same day this year because they we were told that they were going to be the same day. I don't know. I don't think so. Right. We can look. If you look, I don't. I can't look on HeapCal on my computer because it'll disconnect this. But if you look on HeapCal and see if Shavuot on HeapCal comes up on Sunday, then that end will be the same. Because the 50 days starts from the high Sabbath. Right. So whenever 49 plus 1 is from there is what Shavuot is. Yeah. So. Any other questions on why we're having a service on Monday night? But it's only going to be about an hour because we have the Tuesday Seder that's going to be like 17 hours. <laughs> so we want to don't over the <laughs> 7 o'clock. Huh? So we have Monday at 7 o'clock, and then Tuesday starts, the Seder starts at 6.30. Right. So, okay, so now let's dig into Galatians. We're on chapter 4. Chap Where did it go? Is it there? Okay, so we're in Galatians chapter 4, we've done, done chapter 1, 2, 3, and uh, just a, a recap, chapter, chapter 1 tells us that there is a problem in Galatia, and Paul's going to deal with it. The problem was dealing with a different gospel than the one he had preached. For some reason, the <coughs> Apple TV died. Is back. Okay, chapter 2 gives us some history about Paul, why he's an apostle, all that, and it also introduces us to what the, be the beginning of our understanding, what the problem was, and it had something to do with circumcision uh, and making people, be, uh, Gentiles, become circumcised. Uh, chapter 3 goes further into that. Chapter 4 is my favorite chapter in the book of Galatians. If, if I had a chap favorite chapter, this would be, would be it, because it's... First of all, it's very easy to understand if you keep it in context. If you get out of context, it's very difficult to understand. It becomes very confusing. And modern Christianity has <laughs> infused so much bad teaching into chapter 4 that they actually use it to prove things uh, as proof text for their opinion about Torah and, and things like that. So we're going to dig in. Uh, four one now I'm now I am saying so long as an heir is under age he is no different from a slave even though he is owner of everything. So Paul is is talking about Israel and he's comparing Israel to a child who's also the heir to the everything the king's uh, and he says just like a child like my kids will inherit everything that well whatever it is that's left by the time they. To get to actually, my grandkids might inherit. I told my kids they don't get anything. That the Bible says a good man, righteous man, leaves an inheritance to his children's children, not to his children. So, so I'm leaving everything to my children's children, not to my children. Uh, it was up to my father and them to leave to them, and they didn't do it. That's their problem, not mine. We'll just leave it that way. But my my grandchildren are going to eventually inherit whatever's left of whatever I have. But right now, they're under the authority of whoever it is that's telling them what to do. If we put a, baby, a babysitter in charge 
of them. It doesn't matter if they're eventually going to own my house. They have to listen to the babysitter. And so, so that's where what this is talking about. It says, instead he's under guardians and managers until the date set by the father. Now, I want to point out something here that's really important as we get into this. First of all, the word guardian in the TLV in other texts, some of them have schoolmaster. Uh, in other words, but the, the actual word there that's translated guardian from the Greek means a bodyguard, a protector. And so he's under, but, and, and I want to point out, not only does it mean that, but it's plural in the Greek. It's not singular. The reason that's important is because there are those who want to say that this guardian is the Torah, but Torah is not plural. There's only one Torah. There's not Torahs. There's not many Torahs. There's one Torah. And managers, plural, until the de day said by the Father. And the same thing with us. We have our kids are under the authority of their teachers or the people that they're, they're under the authority, their babysitters and, and all that, up until they reach the age of accountability. In our, in our world, generally, that's 18, although I think it should be 45. So... So also when we were underage, we were subservient to the basic principles of the world. Um, again, this, this concept of basic principles of the world are the basic things that take care of things. This is not speaking in a spiritual sense, but it's like the sun gets up, you get up. The sun goes down, you go down. You know, when, when my kids, we used to say when the sun's up, you can get out of bed and you're going to sleep when the sun goes down. We had to be home uh, whenever the lights went on. Do you remember anybody my age? You could go out and play all day long. Your parents didn't worry about you. You weren't doing uh, Nintendo or PlayStation. You were out in the road. You were out playing. You were running around in the woods. But you had to be home when the street lights came on, uh, which also equated to when the sun had set and you had to get home. So they're under not only guardians, but they're subservient to the basic principles of the world. Now, once you get older, you can go out at night. You have the ability to go tend to yourself. You get in a car, you drive, you do things. Uh, but back as a child, you're subservient not only to guardians, but you're subservient to the natural things of the world. Then it goes on, but when, it came, when the fullness of time came, God sent out his son, born of a woman, born under the law. Now... One of the things we have to remember when we're dealing with biblical things is that God is not time um, controlled. And what God does is not time controlled, it's event controlled or event driven. He gave us time so that we could navigate, but he set everything in motion biblically by events. And we could find events by following the events. And one of those, for instance, uh, in Genesis 49.10, it says the scepter shall not depart from Judah until Shiloh comes. So we, it's an event when Shiloh comes, when the, and Shiloh is a reference to the Messiah. And uh, so when Shiloh comes, when this event takes place, uh, we'll know what that happened and, and that changes uh, things as it goes along. So they could watch and see when was the last time there was a king in Judah. It was Herod. So when there wasn't a king in Judah, then um, Messiah had to have come. Another one is Daniel's weeks. You know, this is going to happen. This is going to event, event, event. And that's how we know what things were going on. So the fullness of time is by an event, not by, you know, 630 or 645 or, or whatever. It's, it's, it's an event. So at the fullness of time... God sent out his son, born of a woman, which is important because we believe he was actually born. He was fully human and fully God. And he was born under the law. Now, a lot of times people apply that born under the law to the woman. Like she was married. She was, you know, she did under the law. But he was born under the law. Now... That'll be important as we go on because verse 5 says to free those under the law that we might receive adoption as sons. Now, I want to point out a couple of things. One is he didn't have to be adopted, right? Right. 
He was the father's son. He didn't have to be adopted. My children, my two sons, didn't have to be adopted. The little girl we were going to adopt from Panama, she was adopted. We a separate them. But my children didn't have to be adopted. They were born into the family. So Yeshua was born under the law. But it says he came to free others under law so we might receive adoptions as sons. So if, if he was born as a son and uh, if the law's purpose was to be a guardian up until the time of Messiah, then why did he have to be born under the law? Does that make sense? If the law was just to be a guardian for us up until he came and then the law goes away, why did he need to be born under the law? Because he didn't need a guardian. He didn't need to be adopted. He, didn't need, he was God in flesh. He wrote the book. <clears throat> he didn't need instruction. He didn't need people to tell him how to uh, follow the commandments, how to do. He didn't need, but he, had, he was still born under the law. So <clears throat> I believe when it says to free those under the law, um, the words under the law is qualifying who is eligible to be freed. In other words, he came first to the Jews. That's what it says. He came first to the Jews that they would be uh, set free. But not set free from the law. Set free because they were under the law. In other words, being under the law isn't a bad thing. The law is to guide us. It's to lead us to the Messiah. It's to do all kinds of things. It's so that we would be righteous. The law is liberty. The law is freedom. The law... It's not something that's bondage. We, we have twisted our mind and people read these verses and they come up from Galatians that the law is this bondage that has chained us down and that if we could just break the chains, we could go be free. But that's not what it's saying. It says to free those under the law. I believe the term under the law there is qualifying who he came to free, not qualifying what he came to free them from. And he did it so that we might receive adoptions as sons. Does that make sense? Now, because you are sons, God sent the Ruach of his son into our hearts who cries out, Abba, Father. Now, this is one of my favorite verses, and, and I've said this before at synagogue, uh, but I'm saying it because some of you may not have been here, and also there's people watching the video on tape. Galatians, these verses in Galatians are talking to Gentiles who have become believers in Messiah. And this word Abba is the Hebrew word for daddy. Yes. Uh, it's the personal term for daddy. And, and they're saying because you're adopted, because you're, you're part of what goes on, but because God sent his son into our hearts, then you as a Gentile can cry Abba, Father, just as any Jew can. The word Abba here is a Hebrew word within a English text. We have, we have quite a bit of that, by the way, in the Bible. We don't often pay attention to it, but there's quite a bit of it. For instance, when Yeshua said, Eli, Eli, lama azabtani, he was speaking Aramaic. And the reason he spoke in Aramaic was he wanted us to read Psalms 22, which that is in Aramaic. So we could tell he was quoting Psalms 22 if he said it in Hebrew. We wouldn't have known to look at Psalms 22 because if he just said it in Hebrew, we wouldn't have directed at what was written in Psalms 22. So here, no matter what Bible you use, whether it's a Spanish Bible or a Russian Bible or a, a French Bible or a, a German Bible, the word Abba is in Hebrew, even though the rest of the text around it is in uh, English or Russian or French or whatever, because God wanted to preserve this relational position for Gentiles that they're not secondary kids they're not step kids they're not something that's you know, afterthought but they are equal to any Jewish person who can cry out Abba Father to their daddy in that close relationship that's in the word 4-7 so you are no longer a slave but a son and if a son also an heir through God. Again, he's talking to non Jewish people who have been adopted and become part of the people of God. And he says, You're, you're no longer, because you're set free, 
not from the law, but because of the law, because of what happened to Israel, you get the open door to that. Through the seed of Abraham, all the nations of the earth would be blessed, right? Right. So because of that, uh, you are not just a son, but you're an heir through God. You get to inherit all of the things that are promised to the children of God. But at that time, when you did not know God, you served those who by nature are not gods at all. And he's reminding these Gentile believers that before you knew God, you served things that weren't God. Idols and the sun and the moon and the stars and the water and the trees and frogs and, and cows and lizards and snakes and whatever came along. That was your God of uh, God du jour, the, the God of the, your day, whatever it was. So he said, but now you have come to know God or rather you have come to be known by God. I love that. You know, he, he says to uh, some people who came to him, he says, depart from me. I never knew you, uh, although they knew him or at least of him. They, he didn't know them. He said, you workers of iniquity and the word iniquity, there is uh, anomia, which means no law. You, you who didn't work my my Torah. But he says, rather, you've come to know him. But uh, more importantly, he's he knows you. So how can you turn back again to the weak and worthless principles? Do you want to be enslaved to them all over again? Now, this is really important because Christian teachers will teach that this is talking to Jewish people, telling them that now that they're freed from the commandments, they shouldn't go back to those things. But when we keep it in context of he, they used, these are Gentiles who used to serve gods that really weren't gods at all, why would you go back to those weak and worthless principles? Do you want to be enslaved to them all over again? This is not talking about being enslaved to the Torah. It's being enslaved to false gods, paganism, pagan ritual, pagan things. We need to be careful today that we don't allow paganism to creep into our faith and return to those weak and worthless principles again. He says, you observe days and months and seasons and years. <coughs> Again, there are those that say, <coughs> this is talking to uh, Jewish people about not keeping the holy days, not keeping the months, not keeping the modim, not keeping those. But again, in context, in context has to rule our, uh, our understanding of the Bible. In context, he's talking to Gentiles who are pagans, and he former pagans, and he just said that. And he said, you observe days, months, seasons, and years. You know, Gentiles have holy days too. Um, or at least holidays, if not holy days. <clears throat> and, and I'm not talking about Christmas and Easter there. I'm talking about the pagans that were being talked about here. They, these folks never heard of Christmas or Easter, so that's not a, a, a part of, what, of, of anything. He says, but you observe days, months, and years. I fear for you that perhaps I have labored over you in vain. And Paul is saying... I, I fear that after all my work, it's going to come to nothing. That all my effort, all my time sharing with you. Have you ever shared, the, tried to share the good news with somebody and you shared and you shared and you shared and you shared and it just looked like that instead of moving closer to God and closer to God, they were moving further and further and further away. And, and you feel like you're working in vain. And, and sometimes you share the gospel with somebody and they accept the good news of Messiah. And they start to walk with the Lord and then something happens and trips them up. Or, or somebody comes along and teaches them something that's not true or not biblical. Or in the case of this, that the, the Torah isn't uh, of any value to us today. That we were set free from the commandments of God and now we can do anything we want to. And, and God doesn't think sin is sin anymore and all that stuff. And you go, I, I feel like I've labored for nothing. Like all my teaching, all my sharing, all my prayer, all my time, all my fasting was for no good purpose. He says, I fear that perhaps I have labored over you in vain. He says, I plead with you, brothers and sisters, become like me, for I became like you. You have done me no wrong. Now, this is not saying that he became a sinner. Or, you know, some people will, will look at the, the writings where he says, to, I became all things to all men. That I met when some and say, see, he was a hypocrite and a deceiver and all that. That's not what he's talking about. That's not what he's talking about here. He just said we became family. I became like you. You became like me. It's kind of like our community here. We come from a vast array of backgrounds. Uh, some of us come from Judaism. Some of us come from uh, paganism. 
uh, Miss uh, Lita came from uh, uh, was it Earth Worship or whatever it was at, at, at the time before yeah. she, and and others come from different Christian religions. Some come from others. We have those that used to be uh, Muslims that have come to our our congregation. We have those, but once we came together, we become as one. We become one community, one family. And he says, you, you've done me no wrong. And he's saying, look, you, don't, you didn't do me wrong. You're, what you're doing is doing to God. <coughs> Excuse me. You know it was because of a physical ailment that I proclaimed the good news to you the first time. And, and he's just saying, you know, you know, if you know the story, Paul was, was shipwrecked and hurt. And he's, he's there. He's preaching the gospel to him because he happened to be there. And uh, he says, and though I was through my physical condition was a trial to you, you did not hate or reject me. He said, you know, I was in bad shape and you took care of me and you didn't hate me or reject me. You didn't push me away because I was weak in my body and because I had these things. And he said, no, you welcomed me as a messenger of God or even as Messiah Yeshua. He said, you, you welcomed me so much, I, it was as if Yeshua himself was there. So where is your sense of joy? For I testify that, if you, that you would have torn out your eyes and given them to me if possible. Now, from, from this verse and verses at the end of this chapter, or the end of this book, rather, it, it's understood that Paul had bad eyesight. Um, he says, for I testify, if, if it was possible to do eye transplants, you would have plucked out your own eyes and given them to me so that I could see. The end of the book, he says, and we'll see that in a few weeks, he says, see how I wrote this with my own hand in really big letters. <coughs> Uh, you know, it, which was unusual for him to write his own letters. He had scribes that did that, but this was such an important thing he was dealing with. He wrote it with his own hands, and when you can't see, you write in big letters. Yeah. Right, Pam? Yeah. Okay. He says, so have I become your enemy by telling you the truth? How many folks have ever felt that way? You know, you share the, the truth with somebody, and, and they just reject you. They reject the truth. They reject everything, and and, and uh, although they once loved you, now because you shared the truth with them, you've become like an enemy. So he's asking him, you know, you guys used to love me so much, and now I'm telling you the truth. Now am I your enemy because of that? <clears throat> he goes on, he says, others zealously court you, but not in a good way. But they wish to shut you out so that you will court them. And he's talking about these Judaizers. Now when I say the word Judaizer, understand that these people were people that were trying to get Gentiles to physically convert to Judaism, which required physical circumcision in order for them to be some part of the community. So they were preaching to them, you have to physically become Jewish so you can be one of us. And they were doing it in a way, now listen, we, we look at this sometimes and we say, I just can't believe anybody want to do that. But I can't tell you how many times I've gone places where somebody said, I wish I was Jewish. You know, I, I just wish I was Jewish. You know, and, and it's, it's amazing how many Gentiles have come up to me while I was preaching and say, you know so much. You have such a relationship with the Lord. I just wish I was Jewish. It doesn't have anything to do with being Jewish. It's not like the Matrix where, you know, Jewish people get this thing stuck in the back of their head and it downloads the Torah and the Scripture and they have suddenly all the understanding of everything <laughs> in the world. That's not how it works. Um, but people make people jealous. And, and there are entire movements... That's whole basis is, I want to be Jewish, so here's my text that makes me Jewish. And, uh, and we need to be careful about that. And we need to be careful about anybody who's Jewish who makes a Gentile feel like a second-class citizen in the kingdom because they're not. And we need to be careful about that, but that jealousy comes from that. So to be courted is good. It's nice to be wanted is all he's saying. I think everybody in this room wants to be wanted. Yeah. We, we want to feel like we're welcome, like people want us to be around. He said, but let it always be in a good way. In other words, don't seek to be. That's how come gangs are, become popular. People join gangs because their families are broken, their friends they don't have, and somebody accepts them as what they are, and they become part of the, the gang. Unfortunately, a lot of um, uh, the sex trade results from that same thing. You have unwanted young boys or girls, more girls than boys, but nowadays it's, it's both. They're unwanted and somebody takes them in and, and shows them what they think is love 
and, uh, and they feel like they're wanted and part of something. And he says that being courted is good, but always in a, a good way, and not just when I'm there with you. And he says, don't, don't just watch out for yourself when I'm there. You know, it's kind of like when your father leaves the room and you misbehave, and then he comes back and you go, everything's fine. He says, don't just behave when I'm there. <laughs> Galatians 4, 19, my dear children, again I suffer labor pains, and t pains until Messiah is formed in you. I wish I could be with you now and change my tone, for I don't know what to make of you. And I just love how fatherly Paul is here. I, I can see myself saying that to my, my children. I wish I could talk differently to you. I wish I didn't have to be yelling. I don't know how many times my kids, oh, Dad, all you do is yell. I said, well, if you'd stop misbehaving, I'd quit yelling. I don't want to yell. Nobody wants to yell, but if you'll just do what you're supposed to do, I won't have to. And uh, he says, I wish I could change my tone, for I don't know what to make of you. And he's just, just fatherly. I just don't know what to make of you. Yes. <laughs> hmm? Yeah, he's talking about the, the new man, the full, complete work of God in them. He says, I'm, I'm suffering labor pains until Messiah, until this gets right. He says, you're, you're away from the Lord. I'm suffering just like I'm birthing you over again. And, and, and we do that. We, I don't know. I mean, I've never birthed a baby. I don't know nothing about birthing no babies. But, but, I, but I understand the concept of, of uh, you know, having somebody that I loved and, 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 and walked into the kingdom who got distracted by false teachings and things like that, and then you try to go through the whole birthing process to get them back again. And that's what Paul's talking about. He says, tell me, you who want to be under Torah, don't you understand Torah? Again, this is one of those verses that people say, oh, oh under Torah, uh, don't you understand? And what he's saying is that you guys want to be under the Torah, but you don't understand it. Don't you understand what the Torah teaches? The Torah teaches grace. The Torah teaches the promise of Messiah. The Torah teaches that he would suffer so that we'd have atonement. The Torah teaches all those things. It's the same thing that Berkha Hashanah teaches. The Torah teaches. He said, don't you understand? It's not about the physical. It's about the supernatural, the spiritual. This is where this gets fun. It says, Galatians 4.22, it says, for, as it is, for it is written, Abraham had two sons, one by a slave woman and one by a free woman. Is that about to die? Yeah. Okay. I'll try to go faster. For it's written that Abraham... Had two no, I'm just kidding. Miss Jeannie, I won't do that to you. Um, for it's written that Abraham had two sons, one by a slave woman, one by a free woman. Now, at this point in time, uh, Paul is using an analogy. He, you know, we teach with those all the time. Yeshua taught with parables. This is like that. This is like that. So he's using this analogy... To share about what it means to be understanding of the Torah. Okay? So verse 21 tells us, tell me who you, you who want to be under the Torah, don't you understand the Torah? And then the analogy begins to explain that verse. So if you take the analogy out of the context of what's happening, you're going to come out with the wrong understanding of the analogy. Any analogy separated from its context will lead you to a faulty conclusion. So he says, first written that Abraham had two sons, one by a slave woman and one by a free woman. Now we, we know that. That's from Genesis. We know that Abraham has Ishmael by Hagar, and then he has Isaac by Sarah. So, so we understand that, and they understood that. But one son... <clears throat> the son by the slave woman was born naturally, while the other son by the free woman was through promise. So what's the difference? Natural or promise? Physical or spiritual? The difference is not Torah versus grace or Old Testament versus New Testament. The difference is slave woman, natural, the free woman, promise. You got that? Now these things are being treated allegorically. I love that Paul says just what I said. This is an allegory. 
Retreat Allegory 4, these are the two covenants. One is Mount Sinai giving birth to slavery. This is Hagar. But this Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia and corresponds to the present Jerusalem. For she is in slavery along with her children. Now this is where people get off the road. The wheel comes off the car and just starts floating down the road. You know, when I was uh, a young believer, um, my buddy Scott and I came to faith. And we were just so excited about our faith. And we decided we were going to both go to our parents' houses and we were going to share Yeshua with them. His family were non-believers from a Gentile background. <coughs> My family were believer, uh, non-believers in Yeshua from a Jewish background. And so we, we said, okay, who are we gonna, who, whose house are we going to go to first? And he said, we'll flip a coin because that's what all godly people do to find out God's will. So we flip a coin. So we flipped a coin and he won. So we got in his VW and we headed to Michigan. And we were driving down the road on the way to Michigan on Highway 65, uh, just north of Mobile by Chickasaw. And as we were driving down the road, we looked, and a wheel went by us. And a few seconds later, the VW went. Doom, doom, doom. The drive wheel had jumped off the VW and rode past us. The, the, the wheel came off the car. Uh, and, and that's what happens in this verse. The, uh, many, many theologians, many Bible teachers, the wheel jumps off the car at this point. Okay, the two covenants, one is Mount Sinai, uh, giving birth to slavery, and this is Hagar. Now, what two covenants are you talking about? It's really easy. Think context. He made a covenant with Ishmael, and he made a covenant with Isaac. If we get out of context, we will always get the wrong answer. He made a covenant with Isaac. You're going to have this many kids. You're going to do this. You're going to do it. He made a covenant with Ishmael. You're going to have the 12 sons. You're going to have this. It's, those are the two covenants. It's not Torah versus new covenant. It's not Adamic versus Noahic. No. It's Ishmael's covenant and Isaac's covenant. It's in context. Okay? says, one is Mount Sinai, <coughs> given to slavery. This is Hagar. But, the, but this Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia and corresponds to the present Jerusalem. For she is in slavery along with her children. Now, what happened at Mount Sinai? The Torah was given, right? Okay. So... If we're looking at Mount Sinai and we say what happened at Mount Sinai and the Torah was given at Mount Sinai, we could come across with the idea that this is talking about the Torah. But it's not. How do we know it's not? Because we're talking about physical, spiritual. We're talking about free and slave. We're talking about Hagar and Ishmael and Sarah and Isaac. We're talking about the concept of Physically trying to do something that only God can do spiritually. Why do we have Ishmael? Because God promised Abraham you're going to have a, chum, a son. And Abraham said, but I'm 80 years old. And God says, it doesn't matter. You're still going to have a son. And, and Abraham says, well, how about we make Eliezer my son? And God says, Eliezer is a nice guy, but he will not be your son. And a little while later, Sarah says, well, you know, we still don't have a kid. Let's help God out. Yeah. You go be with my servant, servant Hagar and have a kid. So Abraham listens to his wife, which is the precedent by whereby. I'll go there. We're not going to go there. <laughs> Abraham listens to his wife and physically they try to accomplish God's promise, which has to be brought forth. Spiritually. So Ishmael is born. Okay. So when God had promise and the promise was delayed, man tried to help God out and caused problems. And by the way, we see that pattern throughout the scripture. It's not just with, uh, with Abraham. So in context of that whole concept, which is what this whole book is dealing with, what else happened at Sinai. 
Because it can't be the Torah we're talking about because the Torah is good, the Torah is perfect, the Torah is liberty, the Torah is freedom, the Torah is God's word, the Yeshua is the living Torah, you know, all this. So it can't be Torah we're talking about. What else happened at Mount Sinai that might be relevant to men trying to do something that God was supposed to do? And they did it because there was a delay, the golden calf. But nobody thinks about the golden calf. They read this, they immediately think Torah, Sinai. Mm -hmm. They don't think about Moses went up the mountain. And God promised Moses went up and they got way too long. And the people said, Moses is not coming back. Make us an intermediary. Make us a Moses. Make us something to replace Moses. So they made, by physical power, something to replace what God was going to do. Spiritually. And that's what Sinai in Arabia corresponds to present Jerusalem. Now, how does that relate to present Jerusalem? What was going on in Jerusalem at the time this is written? There's political corruption. There's all kinds of man-made rules. Why didn't the folks in Jerusalem accept Yeshua? Largely because when the coming of Messiah was delayed... They came up with a physical, there's going to be a physical Messiah who is going to become a warrior leader, who's going to be blessed by God to bring about an overthrow of the Roman army and reestablish the kingdom of Israel to its glory as it was in Solomon's time. So that's what's happening in Jerusalem, because of the delay of the coming of Messiah, in their mind, they changed the theology, and now instead of a suffering servant of Isaiah 53, they're looking for the victorious Messiah, so much so that his disciples, Yeshua's own disciples, after he opens their understanding to the Scripture, the Scripture says, and he opened their understanding to the Scripture, and the first thing they say is, are you now going to establish your kingdom on earth? This is so ingrained that his disciples were still hanging on to it after he opened their understanding of the scriptures. So the present Jerusalem is a physical attempt to accomplish the spiritual supernatural, which is one of the reasons why I don't believe that the Ark of the Covenant was in the second temple. won't go into that today, but it's just a little side note. For she is in slavery along with her children. But the Jerusalem above, she is our mother. The Jerusalem above, the supernatural, the spiritual. It's Jerusalem on earth, which was corrupt, political. Um, and the priesthood was political, all that going on. Galatians 4.27, For it is written, Rejoice, O barren woman who bears no children. Break forth and shout. For you who suffer no labor pains, for more are the children of the desolate than the one who has a husband. Now this is a quote from Isaiah. And you can look in Isaiah and find out more about what that is to keep the quote in context. But this is talking about Sarah, the barren, who through, even though she was barren, she had more children. Spiritually, were all the children of Abraham through faith than the one who has a husband. In other words, Ishmael doesn't accomplish what Isaac does. Now, brothers and sisters, like Isaac, you are children of promise. Again, Isaac, promise, spiritual. We're not, you're, if you're Gentile, you're not born again. You're not part of Israel because you were physically circumcised. You're part of Israel because of the promise, because of the supernatural. Just as uh, at that time, the one born according to the flesh persecuted the one born according to the rock, so it is now. The ones that wanted physical were persecuting the ones that were spiritual. But what does the scripture say? Drive out the slave woman and her son, for the son of the slave woman shall not inherit with the son of the three women. This is why when... Uh, when I find somebody, and periodically we have somebody that comes in the congregation and they want to start espousing 
some kind of false doctrine or some kind of false teaching or something. And we're usually, we try to be pretty quick about saying, look, you can't teach that here. That's not what we believe here. You're not going to drive out the son of the slave woman. They're not going to inherit. So then, brothers and sisters, we are, uh, we're not children of the slave woman, but of the free woman. And that's the end of chapter 4. And we're right at the end of our time. So you can turn that off.